So, um, I almost did not make it here to this conference. <laughs> so, Saturdays is my hiking or climbing days, and Sunday was my flight, so it's like, a, hey, I got time for a hike on Saturday. So there's this really lovely hike called Montserrat Mountain, which is 15 minutes away from my house. And so I said, okay, I'll go, you know, what could, yeah, I'll just go hike. So this hike, why is the clicker not working? So this hike is uh, very unforgiving. It just goes up and up and up for three kilometers straight. And uh, it has these really nice uh, markers from like A1 through A11. This hike was uh, like in um, memory of like the firefighters who, who died for 9-11. So this, this trail became like a memory. So they have these uh, really nice markers like to commemorate the World Trade Center building and the firefighters. So I get to the top and everything is okay and I walk back to the car and I am really, really close to the car and there's this little fence and this dirt road so I'm just walking to the car and I almost stepped on a rattlesnake. <laughs> so I'm really glad like I saw it just in time and um, so I stepped over it and I was like, thank you, dear rattlesnake, for allowing me to go to Bucharest. <laughs> so, um, so as I was wondering, the, the, the thing about uh, these hikes is like, yeah, for me as a hiker, it's hard. But I was thinking about like, what would it have been for the first people to have laid this trail where there was nothing but this giant mountain? So I find hiking this hard, but like, can you imagine like all of the planning, the designing, and the building that people had to go through to build this? So how many of you here are modernizing systems? I know you are. Anyone else? See? Okay. So modernizing systems can be hard because you are that person trying to build a trail where there is nothing before and you are trying, you know where the current state of the system is and you're trying to take it to this place where your business needs. So here are a few more peaks in Southern California. I've, I've hiked Takiits, uh, I've climbed it, and I almost gave up. Uh, I know I did give up one kilometer to the top of Mount Baldy. I chickened out. It was the altitude was getting to me, and I was like, okay, I'm good. So, and then there's the mother of all California hikes, which is Mount Whitney, which is like super hard to do. So the things that these hikes have in common is they're all difficult and they all start with high altitude. But even among these, uh, these different hikes, they have different constraints. To hike Mount Whitney, you can't just decide that you want to hike, you have to get into the lottery system and be accepted, and then, you know, you get a chance. And of the 30,000 people that try to uh, hike Mount Whitney, only a third of them actually get to the top. So if you think about, like, modernizing your systems, it is, you know, every application modernization is different. It has its challenges. You have to understand the landscape and the user needs for you to, uh, to succeed. So, for example, like, are you trying to modernize a system that has been built on a Unisys mainframe or an IBM mainframe, and then you're trying to get it to the current times? Or is your system like a few years old, like seven years old and like still like Java or C Sharp, but like older versions and then you're trying to bring it along. So there could be different stages uh, in your app modernization, different constraints. Maybe the people that know the code no longer exist today. So how are you going to deal with that? So these are all the different constraints that you know you are dealing with. So every app modernization project is different. So Today I'm going to share some of my experiences of what like, I have learned through my app modernization journey and some of the processes, practices, and things that are working out for me. So um, one of the things that we think of is like, hey, can we just simply rewrite the system? It's so old, like nobody gets it. Like, like can we just do it? 
So I worked for this company a few years ago, and this is a large company, and they had uh, uh, a software that is meant for airlines for doing cargo reservations. So this company was well known, and um, they're the domain experts. They have like decades of experience in this domain, this transportation domain, and so airlines trust that logic. But it is also a really old system where the, if you think about the user experience, if you think about like making a, a cargo reservation or an airplane, they have like really long forms that they have to fill out. And so the user interface was like, if you had taken those long forms with lots of fields and then turned it into like a web page where you had to just enter all of that stuff. So it was like, a, it wasn't super friendly and it was like really old. Like you can, you can tell like from the look and the feel, uh, it, it is is old. So the company decided to rewrite the system. So what happened was like over a period of time, they wanted to like, you know, just because you're rewriting this really complex domain doesn't mean like your support to your existing airline stops. Like they request features and bugs and so that is getting addressed. So the legacy system is still like going and then this new system is still getting built. But what happened was like when they tried to put like, you know, at one point, like, oh, we think it's okay, let's try. And then when they tried to onboard like one of the customers, it failed. And the performance was bad and it was it was it was unusable. So when they found it like at that point, but that point came at a very great price because it was like several years, like it was like two, four, I don't know, many years of that rewrite work, but in that time that, you know, this company spent with lots of money and resources, their customers were still like stuck with this really old interface. So we were at a dilemma. The company was like, hey, how bad is this thing? Tell us. Like, do we need to give you more money? Like, how much more money would it take to fix this this code base and so we can deploy? Is this really usable? So um, for, we ran numbers, we, we ran tools to look at the quality, the metrics, and, and a whole bunch of things and ended up getting scrapped. It was like really sad. So then we are at this point where, okay, we still haven't solved the user's problems. They've still waited for all these years. And so none of that has been solved. So we needed a new new plan. So the problem was that we didn't put like our users, our user needs first. So when we did this rewrite, there was, so when we did the, the take two, we worked with a, with a team that was specializing in user interfaces, and we collaborated with them and built a very uh, task-oriented uh, collaborative UI and that like they took all the forms, all the screens that the old system had and came up with this and, and we built like API touch points that this React-based interface could talk to to get the information. And this was done in nine months-ish, where at least the customers they were able to get the first feel of how the app looked and, and they were so thrilled. So sometimes like, you know, you don't have to rewrite, so you have to you have to see what is working for your users and you know and based on that go from there. So I joined the Times about like a year um, and a half ago, and I'm currently working as a principal engineer there. So our mission at the Times is to seek the truth and help the people understand it. And so and we do this through uh, like our award-winning journalism with a suite of like, with a spectrum of our digital products. We, we do this so our users can be curious and can, can have like a, a, you know, knowledgeable experience about like the complexities of life from very simple things like, you know, getting recipes every day or like get breaking news alerts. So we are, uh, so, all of these experiences that the users have um, intersect, and this is like one such system that I'm working with, uh, the commerce system. So in commerce, we deal with uh, everything that is subscriptions related, and 
people who are like getting their newspapers delivered, uh, all of the billing, the payments, um, you know, who needs to get the papers delivered, like the print production, the delivery, the fulfillment. So this is like a really, really vast system. And so the, the thing that comprises this is we've got like a variety of, of things. Like we've got some services that are really new, some services that are old, not that old, and some services are really, really old. So it's, it is really a mix. So, but our users, they don't really care about like, you know, whether uh, you have an old system or a new system, whether you're using microservices running on Kubernetes containers or you're using serverless. They care about like, hey, am I going to get my newspaper on time? Can I play Wordle? My neighbor, Vani, she will personally call me if for some reason, any reason, she can't play Wordle. And if she goes, it, it, I know she will be the first person she calls me. So uh, this is what like, our users care. So we are also in this modernization journey, and we are trying to kind of like take our digital experience and our home delivery experience and see how we can like make it in, a, in such a way that like it evolves with our users' needs and um, it can be a seamless experience. So here are some of the things that we did. So we, um, we used Wardly mapping. So Wardly mapping is a, a, a technique, is a, is a process often used for business strategy and getting alignment on business strategy. It's a really useful mechanism. And if you go to learnwardlymapping.com, Ben Mosier has like tons of information about like how you can learn more about Wardly mapping. So uh, the thing with Wardly mapping is, it's this fundamental principle. Everything evolves or it dies. So the, the, the system that we wrote, like um, it's everything is okay, it works. Back when it was written, there's nothing wrong with it. Back when it was written, it was like the state of the art system. There weren't like things like that are available today, like on the SaaS platform. Those things weren't available back then, so we had to write our own. So the thing is, like, this is bringing revenue, so it may be legacy. So we're, we're trying to modernize it not because it's old, but because we want to, like, evolve with, with, our, with our needs. So um, when, like, if you think about it, like, at one point, every, everything was, like, paper-based, you know? print medium. And then in later years, like, you know, once, like, the iPhones and things like that started popping up, the user's experience changed. Now, all of a sudden, like, you, you are able to get a very rich digital experience, like, you know, on your devices. So, journalism and how people are experiencing journalism changed, too. So, we had to, we had no choice but to try and evolve. And that's where things get tricky, right? Because you're trying to build something to be able to keep up with the market. And maybe the old system can't evolve fast enough, but you don't want to lose your, your market share, so you're building new things. So now you've got, like, uh, you're in a state where you've got two things that are trying to do the same job, and so you've, you're, you're adding more complexity, and so now that complexity can, you know, um, revolve around, like, bad user experience because now you've got, like, different things and things can fall through the cracks. So it, it's a vicious cycle. So, um, so this is uh, when, and, and the thing is, like, you know, if you apply, like, good patterns like DDD, then DDD tells us, domain-driven design tells us that it's important to try to, like, take the learnings of your domain and incorporate it in your models, in your code, in your event schema, in your database schema, everything. So if you learned a new concept that is not like how your software works, you're supposed to take that and evolve it, right? So if we do this, then we don't have to worry about like five-year modernization plans and where we're always like in the reactive mode, oh, we have to do this because this changed and oh, it's going to take like X amount of time, right? So instead of always being in the catch-up mode, we can be in the evolving mode where we, we like, you know, our, our code, our design, our software, everything is evolving into the needs of the business. So, so, and so we, if we look at worldly mapping, the way it works is you first build a value chain. You ask yourself, who are your 
like users who are using the system and what are their fundamental like important user needs so now you take that and then ask yourself what capability you have in your system that supports that need and then you can like try to um, like dependency map like okay this capability depends on this service, and this service depends on this component. So you can go down the value chain. So you build this value chain, and then here's the interesting part. You then map it along this evolution cycle. So in Wardley, so this is where I think Wardley mapping is slightly better than like doing a SWOT analysis and stuff because it, this is like actually trying to compare the the what your capability is and how it is applying to the market today in the competitive landscape. So if if this thing, if this capability that you're looking at is brand new and nobody else is doing it and you know it is changing all the time because you yourself are not sure how this is supposed to work here in the experimenting phase then it's stage one and if this is something um, like a really custom just like you know to your company that nobody else like you know can do this then this is um, in the stage two or the custom built so if it's something that is fairly stable and it's like there in the market, like a SaaS product, then it's stage three. And then there are things that you know are so commonly available that you think of it as a commodity. Like, you know, you just go to your cloud and just pin up a server. So you're you're basically renting it at that point. So if if the thing that you are trying to do is falls in stage one or two, then you know that you have to write your own code. But if the thing that you're trying to modernize falls under this space of where it's like product or commodity, why are you writing custom code? This is something that you can try to see if there's a, a vendor in the market that can give you this uh, capability at a, at a much uh, easier way. And so you can save yourselves time by not building this piece, but focusing on the, on the pieces that are so custom and add business differentiating value to you. So when we did this this exercise, what we did was um, we had people and we said, like, okay, take this capability. Where do you think this falls? Like one, two, three, or four. We all like put our answers at the same time. And of course, some of the answers were different, right? So some people think, oh, this is custom, and some people think it's a product. So this is where we don't have alignment and um, we need alignment. And so this is where it'll be good to have like product folks and business folks in that same room so they can share like what they know about the market. We might have created code, so we might have the bias, like you know, something that we created that we want to to keep or or you know, take it forward. But then it may not be such a great idea when you like take this market into account. So this is where it can be really helpful. So the second thing, uh, or another, so we looked at users and user needs, and. Now we have to look at like our own stakeholders and our internal users, their needs, right? So we know that in order to make good software design decisions, we need to um, we need to like talk and collaborate and and get you know have this good collaborative. Uh, discussions and so the way I used to do it in the past is like I know I have to talk to folks and I know this is important so this is mostly out of like my experience and intuitive experience and also I'll try to write down questions that I think are important and then go to the meeting I didn't know it could be a science until like I started working with the design team design and research team at the times uh, my partner Tina from the design team she came up with this very specific approach of doing this in a very systematic way but also in a repeatable way how can we get the information we need in a repeatable way and also so in unbiased way. So this was her process. First, she took us uh, through a workshop, and this was just our team. So she made us all write 
um, frame things as questions that you want to learn about the system that you're trying to modernize. Like what in, in anything you you want to know, you have to frame it as a question. And so we got a bunch of questions, and so we were able to organize. Oh, what are the questions that we already know the answers to? Okay, that's one pile. What are the most important questions that we have to answer and we have to prioritize? So it kind of like gave us that um, like starting point. And so one of the questions was like, hey, who are our internal stakeholders? And so we needed to do a stakeholder mapping. Like, who are we? Who are we going? Going to talk to how is this modernization project going to impact and and, and so um, so my product director he knew the people so we worked we collected we worked with him we did an exercise we worked with him try to collect uh, so we came up with like some eight teams I don't know 25 people different roles like uh, product engineering manager staff engineers and so on so so a mix of people in those roles and so okay so now we have who we need to talk to and we need to ask some questions but what questions do we ask them? So again, like uh, Tina was, uh, she she had a research plan and, and she looked at all the things. We already knew there were some pain points in the system. So we, we had that information. So we um, based our research on like two questions. The users, our internal users, unmet needs. So basically, what are some of the things that they have asked us repeatedly over and over, but like we didn't give it to them? Like they said, hey, can you make this change in this API because it's going to make our life easier? And we're like, oh, sorry, we can't do that right now because like we have these other like priorities and things like that. So maybe they stopped asking. So we wanted to ask them what were those things. And so that was one question. We also wanted to know like, how are they looking at it um, from their perspective? Like, how is this information going to impact them in their short-term and long-term goal? So, with this research plan, then we um, we we had a research approach, and so this was like we this was like the research plan and the questions, and so we went and actually did the stakeholder interviews. So this stakeholder interviews was also like very well thought out. And so we did uh, internal trial run and found out that when you like, you know, have this fig jam board and ask people questions and ask them to type, it wasn't really working. So what we did was like we separated this into two parts where it was just the interview. We asked them, hey, how are you using this? And so it was just very conversational. And then we introduced the second part as an exercise where we asked them like, you know, what are what are some of the things that you're thinking of in the near term, long term? And so that was like a, a, an exercise they would go in and, and do it. So fig jam is like Miro, it's like a whiteboarding tool. So now then, like, we collected all of this information. So this is, like, brilliant. Like, uh, we also recorded these conversations, so we, we, we had uh, something to go back to. So we had all of this data. Now we have to, like, analyze this. So this is where, like, you know, how can we get answers we want out of this research in a repeatable and in an unbiased way? And so we used this uh, method called ORID. ORID stands for, like, objective, reflective, interpretive, and decisional. So the first part is, like, did we, um, what did we, what did we, like, learn? Like, what, did, so in all these conversations, what did we understand? So we went through, so this was a stage where we would go back back to our meeting notes and um, we would maybe look at the recordings. So we wanted to understand our users. So who they are, how they are using the system, what are their pain points. So we collected this data in a systematic way for all of the teams that we talked to. So the second part was like reflecting on it. So based on like, of course, they, they may be some things that we missed out or we couldn't like understand it. So, you know, is there something that we need clarification on? Because we don't want to make assumptions on on those questions. So it's better to go back and ask them. And this is where the recordings kind of helped. So uh, like, hey, let's go and re-listen to that part or let's look at the, the meeting notes. So then we were able to uh, take that and now like, um, interpret that like so where do all of the common things fall like you know we we grouped 
where what, what like so we we took these findings from all these groups kind of see like what are the commonalities what stands out so we did that and so the end result was like we have all this information and this could go into a prd or a decision doc that can help you like base your priorities for your modernization so we did these four things, but like the goal is to, um, when you are modernizing, to make sure that you're prioritizing based on these needs. And these needs are taken into account because, you know, you build empathy that way. They've they've worked with you for so long. They've been asking for this stuff for so long. So it it tells them that they've been heard. So. The other thing that we started doing was service blueprints. So. Okay, we know the user needs, we know the important user experiences, we've also talked to our internal stakeholders, but how, like, how are we fulfilling this particular user journey? What are all the services and like, the software ecosystem that is involved? So before we started using Service Blueprints, when I first joined, I had like lots of information, like you know, documents, meetings, and I was trying to like trying to come up to speed. And I was talking to people, and we were in this group. And, and sometimes we would go in circles. We would linger too deep on one area without getting like a breadth of like understanding. And and so I was asking. So Olivia was my design partner from the design team. She was also in this effort. So I asked her, hey, like, do you like? I'm thinking it would be good to start with the user journeys and, and you know go from there. And she was like, I'm so glad you asked that because I have a fig jam where I have like you know some of these documented. So it was really cool. So we set up a one on one and uh, we you know we, we chatted and uh, I found out that she also likes Korean dramas. I was like hey this is cool. And so we but you know, in with Korean dramas and our love for like user interfaces and and how the user experience it's not just the back end, right? The back end isn't just lived by itself. It is being used by these systems, these user interactions, and at the end is the user that is going to be using these services. So it's really important, and that's when she suggested that we use. Um, Service Blueprints. So Service Blueprints is a uh, service design method. It comes from uh, like design uh, realm. And so this is a really uh, nice way of like visually representing all of the interactions from people to like what they're interacting with, like all of the, the services that you know do the job. And so the first thing is like we picked the most common uh, and most important user journey, which is, which is like a person trying to get their newspaper delivered and they're trying to subscribe to the system. So what are all the user actions? They go to the web page, they, they look at the offers, they say, hey, I want the papers on like Saturday and Sunday and here's my address. Oh, take my credit card. Boom, right? So this is this is what the user is doing. But so in the front stage is, is what the user touches and interacts with that they're close with. So usually typically your UI pages. So the backstage is where like what happens when you click on like the, the the person says, OK, I want this. So this page, this front end system, needs to now know, in order to display all of the offers that are available for this user, what are the offers? So it needs to talk to some back end service. So in that back end service, like it, you know, it talks to, because we have two systems, it needs to get information from here, information from there, and then it gets bubbled up. So we kind of like go like vertically for each of these steps to try to understand what of the services are involved in each of those steps. And so then you, you just go and build like, you know, for every step and then you have this full picture. Of course, when you're doing this, it, it's not like you're not going to be able to do this in like, you know, an hour because this knowledge is in different people's heads and they live in different teams. There's a totally different team that is responsible for managing offers. There's a totally different team that is manage, res, responsible for managing subscriptions. So by you talking to them like individually and collecting this, you're able to build this end-to-end -end journey. So left to right, you get the customer journey and top to bottom, you get like all of the interactions that is involved in each step. So now you have have this clear picture, not just you, but 
your team and other teams now know how this all of these services interact to to give this uh, end user experience. So now you can reason about like, okay, what are the technical problems? Like, what are the architectural problems? Are they scaling bottlenecks? Are there, is there temporal coupling? So those are the things that like you can bubble up and and come up with and say, okay, I think that maybe you know. For this thing, we need to start here because this is the most problematic experience. So the other thing that we started using a lot is this method called Double Diamond. It's a, um, it's a, it's a research method uh, designed by the British Design Council. And, and so this, this method is uh, basically like very useful when you are trying to like have, um, sometimes we, when we think of a problem, we already have a solution in mind that you know we think is going to work. And but sometimes that solution that you're thinking might impact several other teams. And so it's really good to have a framework where you can take this deeper and analyze how it impacts all of your other services. So with service blueprints, you kind of saw like all of the important user journeys mapped out, all of the services that work together. And, and so sometimes it's like, you know, when you're making a, a small decision where maybe like, hey, this this way or that way, and you can figure it out in a mirror board lay it both side by side, look at pros, cons, like boom, you're done. But when it touches like large amounts of groups and people, then this method is super useful. So the double diamond, like the name, like has two diamonds. And uh, one is for the problem, to explore the problem. And the other is to explore the solution space. So the, in, the, in the problem diamond, so the diamond is like, you know, first the part is the discovery. You diverge, so you go out like, you know, different ways to try and find like different aspects of the problems. And by having different stakeholders involved, they can share their perspectives of the problem that are important to them. And so uh, we did like a uh, kickoff. And in this kickoff, we had like all, all the teams um, we had like 40, 50 people and from various representation. And so we ideated about this problem. And we then the group came up with, hey, here's, here's what we think uh, is interesting. And so we collected that. And then we did some uh, asynchronous research because you can't just try and solution all eight, all eight ways, right? So, so are there any meaningful ways that you can like, you know, um, dwindle it down to say maybe two options? So what, what would that research look like? And so we did that and then we presented the findings and in that workshop we, we took that and said, okay, so now we have some data, we had these groups and, and so now we're able to say, okay, I think these two options might work. So now we take like each option through all of these important user experiences we've, we've uh, collected in the service blueprints, like we know all of the services and the interactions. Now we can say, okay, option one, what happens when the user subscribes to this? How is this gonna work? And then you can compare it with option two. So you can look at both. And so again, like in the solution diamond, this is the part where you're diverging and you're saying like exploring all of the different possibilities and then trying to see which one is going to work. And then of course you gotta dive you gotta converge on the solution. So now you've got like, you know, you've looked at both, now you you have you you can make some meaningful trade-offs and you can uh, then align and say, okay, we're going to try this. So this is a really good method for, for where like, it involves like, large teams, where you need to have that alignment. So uh, we found this really useful. So in order for you to be like, really successful like, in this, you got to be a really good facilitator of the workshop because You've got like 50 people, like remote or in person. Then, then it's like you know, how how do you make sure all of these people are aligned and they're speaking the same language and and uh, they are understanding like what you're trying to do because that's a large number of people. It's time that you are asking, so you got to be um, you know really judicious about that. And so um, I used a lot of principles from Dan and Mike. They uh, have these. Uh, um, so they they have really good. 
design patterns, I call them design patterns, but the patterns, uh, to see like, you know, how, what makes this group facilitation work really well. Like, you know, inviting dissent, for example, like, you know, being open to inviting dissent, like un inviting all kinds of opinions and, and allowing like, you know, individual thought and like thinking together as a group. So. This is like a whole new science. And, and so I used some of uh, Mike and Dan's pattern and they, you can read about them uh, in the whenandhowstudios.com. And, and so I found this to be really incredibly powerful, especially when I was trying to have those group conversations. So we've done, you know, we've gone through stuff and, and we've made some decisions. Documenting the decisions is really, really important. And, and so I tried, I tried different, different things and it's not just architecture decisions. Um, it is like, why are you making this choice? And it could be a product decision. Like maybe we are trying to do only this for right now and we don't want to do this feature. So there could be a lot of important decisions, but like we often fail to understand like why that particular decision was made. And, and sometimes this is really important to like gain alignment between two different teams. Maybe you are thinking like this way is better. Maybe you are thinking this way is better. But maybe, you know, during these workshops, you've come to an alignment, but it's important to document like this process. So this is a, a simple template after playing around um, and trying it for several months in different ways. Finally, um, I kind of took my design team's template for their research plan and took like the architecture uh, decision template like from like what you know properties make a good ADR and kind of like merged them together and came up with this and this is working out really well so you want to be able to know where is this decision at at any moment so you've got like a, a status thing on top always tells you so if this is the first time you drafted it it's draft and I have some action items on what I need to do who do I need to talk to um, what what you know and but in in the general sense it has like what is the question you're trying to solve and, and some context about it. And you may not know the recommended decision right away, and that's okay because you're just in draft. You haven't like really figured it out. But then as you look at the other options and you know who your stakeholders are, and as you like walk through this option and what, what is the impact to this team and this team services, it's it's really you know useful and a lot of times, a lot of these discussions are in meetings, so you might have meeting notes documents, and if you're using Slack, oh my god, like the Slack threads, they're never ending. So the, a lot of times they may be in different places, in FigJam, on Miro board, so you, you can put them all together, and you can take this process. So, so once you've done, maybe, maybe this requires a POC, so one of my action items would be like, do a POC to do... X, Y, Z. And then once I finished the POC, like I would document the results and say like the impact was this. And, and, and so this could become like a proposed and you can get the buy-in from your stakeholders and then this could then be adopted. So the good point is about this is like three months from now, maybe this decision doesn't make sense anymore or maybe some of the properties around this has changed and maybe you need to go a different path. But at least you know on what like factors or what are the constraints like yes we agreed to do this but we know that if you do this you cannot do x y and z right it's clearly there so having such a document i think is really powerful and it's been really really helpful and um it's a so I did this and then later on I read this article uh, from Andrew. It's called Scaling the Practice of Architecture Conversationally and he wrote this I think December of 2021. I wish I'd read that a lot sooner before like you know my own like evolution process of this. But um, so to kind of like recap this is like sort of like my heuristics and you want to base your modernization you know based on your users and and that is like the key so always like start start with your user start with your user needs and know whether you should be buying something or building you use Wadley map and of course like you know there's SWOT analysis too there's other methods of trying to understand strategy and understand like 
what is the impact on your internal users and the user needs? And we talked about these methods. And, and so these are really great. And in order to build this shared understanding of the current state, I talked about service blueprints. But there are several other methods, like value stream mapping, domain storytelling. And so these, these, are, these are also other methods besides event storming. So before I knew all of this, I used to think, OK, event storming, event storming. But there's a whole lot of like other tools and things available. So you got to pick like, you know, what serves you best and, and use it. So um, the, use the double diamond when you have to like have consensus and bring all your users along the shared journey. So it's not a shock to them when you say, hey, we're going to do this. And they're like, what? Right? So you don't want that. So this double diamond is a, is a, is a great approach to focus on like, you know, understanding the problem first before jumping into the solutioning. And of course, document, document, document always your decisions. So the cool thing is this understand and know that there are so many tools in the toolbox, and you don't have to always pick the first one. So the, the, the thing about this whole process and why it worked really for us is because we were doing a lot of experimentation, we were doing a lot of learning, and we were just repeating the process. In the first time we did service blueprints, it wasn't so great because we were trying to map certain things differently, and it was like looking complicated. And so. So we, um, you know, we refined it, and we refined it, and and Wardley mapping was like new to the team, but they were open and trying it and learning it. So we, I'm just so blessed that I'm working with a really awesome team. So like this sort of like you know being open to new thoughts, experiments, and constant learning is great. And once you have this, you can repeat the process. So I was able to take the service blueprint. Um, method, and I was able to help another team, a different mission, like use the method to understand current state, and again, like you know, the end-to-end -end processes and interactions. So, the trick to this is, of course, <laughs> the secret sauce is that it's it's everything touches and is based on the human connection. The systems that you're building is for the users, and how, who you're collaborating, how you're going on this modernization journey is also very, very people-based. And we live in this like crazy remote world, post-pandemic world. We just have to be kind to each other. And, you know, and, and those human connections matter, be it K-dramas or, or like celebrating Argentina winning the World Cup. Like those things matter and, and you make these human connections and through these human connections we can become better communicators, better listeners and be more empathetic. And so if, if you are like that for your team, with your product manager, if everybody is that way, then the modernization, the, the whole process is going to go along um, well. So. I want to wish you the best in your adventure, and uh, thank you for listening.